Okay, um, so uh, it's my great pleasure today to welcome Nan Jiang. Um, Nan uh, got his PhD from uh, Michigan with Satinder Singh. Um, he was our former postdoc in the New York, New York lab and uh, taught me a great deal about reinforcement learning. And uh, he's currently faculty at Urbana-Champaign and will tell us about some of his exciting recent work. Okay, thanks, Alec, for the introduction. And I'll tell you the real story. The real, so I've been interned here at Redmond and uh, New York City in MSR, the two labs twice. And I asked, uh, uh, like, Alec was like, uh, I mean, I missed the time that I do an intern. Can I do another intern with you? And Alec was like, uh, all our summer intern slots are occupied with better people. But maybe we can have you here for two weeks. I'm like, OK, I'll take it. OK, so, okay, so um, uh, uh, I'm currently a faculty at uh, UIUC, um, just starting. And uh, mostly I work on theory of reinforcement learning. And today I'll talk, uh, tell you about something that I've been thinking about recently. Um, and uh, this is uh, joint work with my student, uh, Jingling Chen, uh, at UIUC. OK, so I guess I don't need to say too much about the background of RL, right? Like, this is a super hot air, like, uh, area. Everyone is thinking about, like, uh, we're going to uh, soon applying RL to a wide range of cool applications. And then we've already got like, uh, much success in like, video and board uh, game playing domains. And all of these settings uh, are, have the, um, or most of these settings have the characteristics that we're dealing with very large and complex state or observation spaces, uh, which are beyond the so-called tabular or finite state space. Um, setting that uh, RL started with. So this is a very exciting, OK? So what I would, and there are many, many different kind of uh, uh, approaches to RL or different settings that you can be, find yourself in. Uh, today I will focus on a particular type of RL algorithm called value function approximation, OK? And in particular, I'll consider the case where we use a restricted class of candidate value functions trying to approximate the optimal value function Q star, which I'll uh, define formally in a second. OK? And moreover, I'm going to consider the batch mode learning. That is, I'm given like just uh, passively some data. And, and the data is exploratory in some sense. And, but I don't have online access to the environment. I cannot actually just interact with the environment. Uh, but I need to figure out a good value function and induce a good policy. OK? And so why, this, uh, why is this kind of uh, setting interesting? Well, basically it's because, you know, like, so algorithm that works in the setting are generally referred to as approximate dynamic programming, and, uh, or ADP. And ADP algorithm actually formed the backbone for the modern success of deep RL, right? And in particular, we're not really addressing, like, challenging issues such as exploration in a very serious and provable manner. So really, you... I mean, even if you have access to the environment, most of these algorithms rely on some like benignness of the data and easiness of exploration to succeed. So you can actually relate them a lot to like these algorithms that uh, work in the um, batch setting. And and for example, the the, the algorithm that I'm going to focus on today, like uh, fit Q iteration. I mean, basically, if you do an online approximation to it and hook it up with something like epsilon mm -hmm. greedy exploration, you get like DQN, right? So so since these methods are very central to the uh, success of uh, deep RL, like one actual question we should ask from the theoretical side is obviously, well, like when do they succeed, right? So when can we guarantee sample efficient learning? So and and so I want to get some kind of like theoretical guarantee for that, and I'm 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 kind of like a minimalist, okay? So I, I want to write down like a minimal set of assumptions and write down a clean result that says, OK, we can get like, sample efficient learning. So let's see how do we do that in supervised learning and, and try to like, get an analogy for RL, right? So when you study like, uh, learning theory for supervised learning, uh, you get something like this in your day one class, right? So this is like 101 uh, like statistical learning theory. Well, let's say we have data, x, y, like feature and label pairs from a joint distribution, which is unknown. And you have a class of predictors, like f, right? So, and for now, let's just assume, like, in the simplest manner, that it's a finite class, and one of them is a good predictor, okay? And what you want to do is that you want to find a good predictor that predicts y from x within this class, 
using a small amount of samples. And it is well known that, roughly speaking, what you need is a log f um, number of samples to succeed in this, right? at least information theoretically. Right? And, and, and the way to do it is very simple. right? You just say, um, I minimize training error, and just output the like, predictor that minimizes, that, that, uh, minimizes the training error. And to guarantee that it's actually pretty good, just use Hovding and Unibound and get uniform convergence, and that's it. So this is what you learn like, in your day one. This is too simple, and you just move on to more sophisticated theory of supervised learning like, later on. But at least this is the like, foundation of the entire like, learning theory. Right? So wouldn't it be nice or wouldn't it be like, necessary to get something similar for RL, you would think? Right? So let's try to make an analogy <coughs> for reinforcement learning. Right? So again, we're thinking about this batch mode value function approximation setting. You know, we have data. So in RL, as I'll explain shortly, the data looks like things like, at least in the off, like offline, the, the batch learning setting, the data looks like something like state action. When you take an action at a state, you see an immediate reward and transition to the next state. Okay? So you get a collection, a, a bag of these kind of tuples, and that is your data. And it's drawn from the MVP, the underlying environment. Okay? And it will formalize what it means for that data set to be exploratory, OK? And then again, similarly, we're going to assume that we have a, a class of candidate value functions, f. And one of them is the function that we want to ultimately approximate, the q star, OK? And now, similarly to like supervised learning, right? So, so why do we want logarithmic dependence on the number of candidate value functions, oh, sorry, candidate predictors in supervised learning? Well, because logarithmic dependence opens the door towards using sophisticated function approximation techniques, right? So roughly speaking, for example, if you have a neural net, the number of predictors that you can represent with a neural net, roughly speaking, is exponential in the number of like, parameters, right? So you don't want to pay any polynomial dependence on the size or on the cardinality of, the, of your uh, hypothesis class, but rather you want to pay logarithmic dependence. So similarly, we want to pay logarithmic dependence on the cardinality of the function class in the RL setting. And the question is, can we do that? Right? And, or what additional assumption do we need in order to do that? Yes, go ahead. It's going to be important that over here you've said a near optimal policy rather than a near optimal uh, F. F. Uh, you're right. We are, yes. We, we, all, all we care about is a near optimal policy. Um, uh, although I don't know, like in this case, how do you get it without? So, so basically, um, having access to F instead of its induced policies only gives you more information. So you need to leverage that. So, I, so basically, that means like I don't know a way to approximate a good a good policy without actually approximating Q star. Okay. So. Um, so, the, so, okay, so I, like, these are like, still pretty vague. I'll define them uh, precisely in a few slides. But roughly speaking, like, so here we're, we're, we're already making a few assumptions. The first assumption being that the data is exploratory. And the second assumption, which is similar to what we make, like one of the predictors is good in the supervised learning setting, usually we call these kind of assumptions like a realizability. Right? It's like there is a target function that you want to approximate. Well, at the minimum, you want to assume that your function class approximately captures that function. Okay? So let's say we are comfortable with making these two assumptions. And let's ask, can we actually find a near optimal policy using this many samples? Okay, so anyone wants to make a guess of whether the answer is yes or no? Okay. Are we pessimistic say no? Sorry, say it again. Are we pessimistic and say no? Okay, so pretty good. Uh, pretty good guess. So the answer is we don't know. Okay, and the conjecture is that no. And I think every, every single, or I would say, I, I, I would guess that most people who work on ADP would say no. But we don't really have a lower bound against this setting. And this is what I'm going to talk about. And I'll walk you through all the setup and all the nuances in it and what are the interesting implications of all these. Okay? So in order to do that, let me just set up the problem slightly more formally, right? So we're, as usual, in RL, we're going to consider Markov decision processes. Right? And here, I'm going to consider a version called the episodic version, where, um, where you know, like this small h denotes the time step. 
Like, so you, uh, for each episode, you start from some initial state S1, and you, the agent observed the state from a very large state space, okay? And you choose an action from a finite and small action space. We're not uh, worrying about large action space today, okay? And then you get some immediate reward that tells you how good this action is under the state, but only like um, for the current time step, okay? And then you transition to some next state according to some transition dynamics. The map state action to a distribution over next states, okay? And you repeat this uh, like several times, um, and that's what we call a trajectory, okay? And in general, we're gonna consider like uh, what we call policies, pi, which are mapping from states to actions, or sometimes states to distribution of reactions. So these are basically um, the agent's decision-making uh, decision strategy, right? So at, it, it tells you if you're at this state, what action you should take, okay? And we measure the ultimate goodness of a policy using this uh, V super pi, which is the expected return discounted, that is, uh, you know, at every time step, you're getting this reward, and what you care about is the long-term cumulative reward with a discount factor or within a finite horizon. So there's a notion of like how many time steps do you need to look ahead, okay? And here's this gamma is a discount factor. It's just mathematically convenient to use this formulation. And if you're not familiar with discounting, just think about like that will roughly translate into this so-called effective horizon H which says that the, the episode lasts for H steps, and you need to optimize for the sum of rewards and expectation within the episode, okay? And here's this new, new norm is the initial state distribution, right? So in many episodic tasks, the initial state or distribution is pretty well defined. Like when you're playing like board games, usually you start from the empty board. And that's the, that's the state uh, from which you care about maximizing your reward like winning or lose, okay? Okay, so this is like, a, uh, you know, like every, uh, every deep RL paper is like playing video games now, so I gotta like make an example using video game. So, you know, like let's say this is the Atari game, so we're, roughly speaking, we're gonna have like a pixel, a raw pixel game screens as states, okay, or observations, if you want to be strict. And then the, the actions you take are like the, the control signals that you send to the game. And the immediate reward you get is the, like, the game points, the increment in game points, right? And then you transition to the next state, uh, possibly in a random, uh, or, uh, random manner because of like a random spawn of the enemies or other random events in the environment, okay? And what you want to learn is a mapping that tells you in this game screen, what action should I fire, right? And what you care about is uh, to maximize the total amount of like game points you obtain within a particular period, okay? So this is the MDP setup. Um, and there are like a few key solution concepts which I uh, guess some of you are very familiar with, but just um, to quickly review it. So the Q star function that I was talking about uh, 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 a while ago is this function that says if you start from a particular state as and then take the first action as A, then you behave optimally afterwards. You maximize your total discounted reward. What is the maximum value that you can get from there, right? And why is this quantity important? Well, because of two reasons. First of all, if you know this quantity, you will immediately get the optimal policy because then you can just behave greedily according to this Q, Q star function, and that policy is simply optimal, okay? And the other reason is that, you know, this, when, when, you, when we think about like a maximize over all possible policies, this is a pretty like, this is a combinatorial space, right? So it's like for every state, you can just choose different actions, okay? So optimizing directly in it uh, is challenging in various ways. But if, if all you want is to fit this Q star function, this Q star function satisfies a very elegant, what we call Bellman equation. Uh, this is the Bellman uh, principle of optimality that relates the optimal value at the current step to that at the next step. So it gives you a recursion, and if you can solve this recursion, and you get, you solve the problem entirely, okay? So this is, and, and this is what we're trying to approximate today. Any questions before I uh, move on? 
Yeah. Just paging back to the connection to supervised learning. Sure. Are the statistical learning theory results for ERM and Hopkins and Union? Do they hold for regression too? Because here, this is a regression problem that you're. Yeah. Asking. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Right. It does. They right. all hold for regression. Yeah. Yeah, pretty pretty straightforwardly, right? Just think about like instead of have have zero one loss, you have like a bounded square loss, and that will concentrate. And I was so. thinking about the, the finite hypothesis class. Yeah, the, the same way. Yeah. So we can uh, solve it within what? Uh, yeah. We see. Uh, yeah, I mean, you. See, I mean, when you, the logarithmic like simply like shows up when you uh, do union bound over all finite hypotheses, right? So so either you can do. <clears throat> literally like finitely many hypotheses um, or if they are infinite you can go to like, like pseudo covering dimension, numbers, pseudo dimension, right, like right, complexity, covering number, yeah. but, but many problems. of them actually go back to like finite classes, right? It's if you're recovering, you're literally just covering the continuous space with a finite but exponentially large um, like cover centers. Okay, so this is the basic MDP setup. Okay, so um, in our bachelor learning setting, as I mentioned before, we're going to get the data set D, where that's state action reward next state tuples, where SA, we're going to assume for simplicity, the SA pairs are drawn from some data distribution mu, and we're going to assume that this mu is exploratory in a particular sense. And then once you specify the distribution over SA, then the reward, of course, should be uh, generated by the reward function, and the next state should be generated according to the environment dynamics. right? Um, so this is the data you have, and we're going to have this uh, function class f, uh, which is a finite class, and, it, and for now, let's going to just assume that it captures the q star that you want to approximate. Okay? And our goal, of course, is to find f that approximate q star such that it induces a very good greedy policy. And the reason that we're using greedy policy is because we know that um, the greedy policy of q star is pi star. And uh, it is actually very easy to show that if you have a good approximation of Q star, its greedy policy is also near optimal, depending on how close your approximation is. Okay? Yeah, go ahead. So, um, <clears throat> you know, I guess we are looking at um, just these uh, uh, quadruples because we want to look at one step of many equations, right? Yes. Is there, right. Is there like, any reason to think that any of this becomes sort of nicer or significantly different if we when you have trajectory data? Yeah, and I, I want to look at like multiple steps into field. Yeah, so that's a very good question. Uh, although, I mean, um, uh, I guess one particular difficulty here is that here we're considering like a Q learning, right? Q learning style thing, yeah. which there's a max operator which gets super annoyed when you have like multiple steps. In particular, usually the the only way to do it is to do like multi-step important sampling, which kills you with exponential variance very fast. Um, of course, if you're doing uh, policy duration type of things and within the policy evaluation step, definitely it will be very useful to have trajectory data. And in fact, if you look at later when we talk about the lower bound and so on and so forth, it seems like uh, uh, some of the hardness m could be induced by having these tuples instead of having um, uh, like full trajectories. Okay. Okay. So and, <clears throat> so and and recall that when I say a greedy po uh, policy is epsilon suboptimal, I'm I'm still talking about this this scalar v super pi, which measures the goodness of a policy. And by epsilon suboptimal or epsilon optimal, I'm just saying like this is within the epsilon value of like the maximum possible value it can possibly get. Okay. So this is all fine, and uh, uh, so like, how are we going to actually do this, right? So how, in particular, how we're going to try to uh, solve the Bellman equation when the state, actually, state space is very large? And just to give you like a taste, right? So briefly speaking, like when you do this uh, game playing um, uh, in this game playing uh, domain, you can think of like the data you get is like frame is the current state, action is your control signal. And you get game points, and that points to another uh, state, right? So in general, you can think of all these game screens connected together and form a huge graph, which is the MDP. And of course, you can't do any like exact, um, so, uh, exact algorithms like value duration or policy duration uh, as you can do for a finite and small state space. So what, what now you do is that you do function approximation, right? So in practice, what you would do is that you would write on a uh, perhaps parameter parametric form 
uh, of like f of s a given theta, where theta is the unknown parameters, like theta could be the uh, the weights on the connection uh, in a neural net, and you try to um, use this parameter, uh, parameterized form to approximate the Q star. Uh, so basically, you want to now search for the parameter theta such that f theta is approximately Q star, right? And the way you do it is to say, okay, I can just simply look at the Bellman equations induced from data. Okay, so this is very rough and not accurate, but just to give you an idea. So I'll have some sample data, and that will induce some version of Bellman equations, and I will try to minimize the errors uh, of this uh, equality uh, to, to, and hopefully get a theta such that f theta is a good approximation of Q star. And to connect back to our learning theory setup, here, uh, basically, the, the f, the hypothesis class we have is basically all the possible value functions that this neural network can represent, right? So that will correspond to our function class. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so now we're, we have more, slightly more formal setup, so we can go back to our earlier question and ask that question again in more precise technical terms, right? So can we learn a f that gives us a near optimal policy within a sample complexity that is polynomial in these things, right? So we have log dependence on the hypothesis class. H is the horizon, if you remember, 1 over 1 minus gamma. It's like how long I'm looking ahead for. And 1 over epsilon and 1 over delta are just standard uh, pack learning parameters. If you don't, are not familiar with them, just don't bother with you them. You don't say what log and or delta? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> um, OK. <laughs> So, so now we have a precise question, right? Is this possible or not? Okay. So now you know, like, like although DeepRL has thrived for I don't know, like five or uh, five years also. Uh, question. So, so I'm just thinking back to the BQN implementation. Mm -hmm. and don't they sp take specific care to ensure that the tuples are sort of uncorrelated? Like when they just happen to collect the same trajectories, then they worry about like. Uh, yeah, I mean, so they try to mix in data from right, right, right. So there is definitely a correlation of the uh, tuples issues in practice. I mean, here we're avoiding it altogether by assuming a IID S -A drawing SA from IID, right? And uh, you can actually find in literature where people are thinking about like a, like having a data from a single long trajectory, but this, but you need to make more technical assumptions. Like this, this process is like beta mixing or whatsoever, and you lose a bit of sample efficiency. But I'm not just I'm just not getting into all that technical details, okay? As I said, I'm a minimalist. I, I, I like to remove all of those things that just, uh, I mean, I, I'm too stupid to understand that, yeah. Uh, what is the data distribution that we are talking about here? So, I will, I will, so it's some distribution. But we will need to make some assumptions on that distribution, which I will be talking about soon. Uh, so we assume here that we have big F, right? Yes, we have the app. That lab is like, for example, correspond to the neural net architecture that you specified. Oh, okay, so like all the possibilities of the weights. Yes, exactly. Right. I mean, this is like a like as I like as I shown in the title. This is like an information theoretic view, right? I'm not thinking about optimization and all of that. I'm assuming that you can search over like all those possible ways um, using anything using any information that you could get from data, right? And let's see like what to what extent you can accomplish the learning task uh, in that case. Okay? So, yeah, so back to where I was, you know, like, although DeepRL has, like, only thrived for, like, five or more years, you know, this whole, like, this whole thing of, like, reinforcement learning and approximate dynamic programming have, like, lasted for, like, 20 or, I don't know, even longer, 20 years or longer. So people must have thought about this, questions like this, right? So in fact, if you look into literature, when people analyze algorithms that looks like something like Q learning with function approximation, um, they do give you finite error bounds that trans can translate to polynomial sample complexity that looks somewhat like this, but only with two more additional assumptions. Okay. So the first assumption is on data, which is fully expected, right? So it's like our data has to be exploratory. Let's say if your data only look at a single state action pair and don't tell me what happens elsewhere, sure, like what I can do, right? So at least I need my data to cover, in some sense, the entire state space. Uh, although how to, if, but uh, 
but the 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 the, the um, the important detail is here is like how do you measure the notion of like exploratoriness uh, is kind of a tricky, and I'll introduce like how do we think about that in a minute. But but it's it's pretty reasonable that we'll have a need a assumption on the data distribution. Okay. Now it turns out that there is another more interesting and more uh, more tricky assumption people make on the function class. Okay. So we are already assuming that the function class can capture the Q star, which is the standard assumption or the, or the dream assumption that you ever make in supervised learning, right? So, but in our theory, we say, this is not enough. Let me make another assumption, which I'll explain in detail later, that says the entire function class also has to be closed under this Bellman update operator, okay? And we'll see what that means uh, later. Okay, so, so let's look into these assumptions. And, and basically, what I want to ask here, I mean, in this paper and uh, for today's talk is like, um, do we really need these two assumptions and what's their roles uh, in, in governing the sample complexity of uh, batch value function approximation? Question. So if, if your class is not closed under the Bellman update, but you right. can still project back into, into the space. Right, then you, so but algorithmically, you can still run the algorithm. But yeah. we can show, so basically there are, Algorithm specific hardness result against the removing this assumption that has been known things like 1994, right? So, like a t all TD type methods that learn from bootstrap targets okay. will diverge. Yeah. Well, uh, so even if even if you somehow can guarantee that this projection will preserve monotonicity, uh, it doesn't. Uh, like what monotonicity. kind of monot monotonicity? So is you, it? you always get closer to the fixed point. No, you don't. If you add a projection step in, onto it, yeah. you no longer have that contraction problem. Yeah, 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 right. But if you somehow, if you somehow, yes, exactly. That's 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 one other way. So, so basically, you can, you can replace this assumption with something different. For example, yeah. the projected Bellman update also being a contraction, which I will actually yeah. mention later. I mean, there are like various different assumptions that you can plug in here, but the upshot is that you need something much stronger than realizability. Okay, and. And that's not quite desired, right? So think about machine learning. Like in, in, in standard supervised learning, we every practitioner fight like almost like all of what they're doing is trying to get close to realizability while avoiding overfitting. Like that's the whole battle, and it's already pretty hard. If we're adding like more requirement on it, it's definitely not that desirable. So we want to understand if this is really necessary, right? Okay, so. So, so in the rest of this uh, talk, I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into these two assumptions and uh, talk about a few nuances about it, and let's see like, whether, whether do we really need them or not. Okay? So first, the, the assumption on data. Right? So, so here's, the, here's the thing. right? So we say that the data distribution should be exploratory. What does that mean? Well, so if you have a finite state and uh, state space, you can say, I need enough samples for every single state. Sure, that will be an exploratory data set. But what if your state space is continuous, uncountably infinite? Well, you can say it's relatively uniform, but uniform under what measure? Right? So you, you now realize that the notion of exploratoriness is not that clearly defined in this case. So what people have thought about in literature is to define the degree of exploratoriness in the following sense. Okay. So let's see, I'm just here, here's a very like, brief abstract illustration where we're considering multiple distributions over the state action uh, space. Okay? And this mu is our data distribution. right? And so we say that a mu is very exploratory. If for any policy you care about, you look at what distribution over state action that that policy induces when you, ex when you execute that policy, and you compare these two distributions. And you say, if, if these two distributions are always relatively close to each other, then I say that my data policy is pretty uh, exploratory. Right? So the idea is that whatever place, whatever states that some other policy want to visit, my data distribution always provide good coverage over that part of the state space. But if your state space is continuous, then how can you sure. have a uniform upper bound? Like, you can uh, only have it in, again, some measure. No, you can have a uniform upper bound, like, like if you have like a low rank MDP or something like that. 
Okay, yep, <laughs> that's what we show in the paper. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, so technically speaking, what we're going to do is that we're going to look at any policy pi, probably some this is the greedy policy of some value function in your class, and look at the ratio between the densities of these two distributions, and let c be a uniform upper bound on this density ratio, where uniform meaning like like maximum over all possible policies, okay? So basically, if the C is small, then we're getting a very exploratory data set, okay? And you can prove all the things about it. So, um, right, so another way to say C is small is to say like we're gonna allow our, poly our sample complexity to depend additionally, polynomially also on C. So when C is large, our, our sample complexity like completely explodes, but that's fine. It's, that it's because learning is hard is because we don't have good data. But if C is small, we do expect that we get good uh, sample complexity. So the, the, the data set that you have, uh, is it a multi-set? So in other words, does it reflect the actual distribution of, of mu or just the support of this distribution? No, it's the actual distribution. It's not a, it, you don't care about support, right? Because if, if it puts like extremely like small probability on some state action pair that is super important, then that's also pretty bad. No, I mean, so the, you're going to be learning from the actual data set. Yeah, yeah the so actual data set. So, but this is the distribution from which that data set is drawn. Interesting. Yeah. So even though the data set does not necessarily reflect the distribution, I mean, you only. Yeah, I mean, but with high probability, all of that, like all kinds of properties in the data will be close to whatever property in the actual distribution. No, with high probability, you're going to maybe get every, every tuple from the support of mu, but you will not actually get, like, the, the data set does not preserve the number of copies that you may have sampled from, from mu, right? So if, if, uh, if a particular well, tuple is very okay. likely, I don't think it's a unique set of SA tuples. Like it is a multi-set. Like the same well, SA can right. be sampled twice from you. Yeah, you you you're just drawing samples from the distribution. Yeah, you're just drawing yeah, ID samples, samples from the distribution. But then do you, do you keep all each sample, or do you I mean, do you collapse? If you even sample the given couple, I don't know, three times, do you include it? In oh, you you, you include all of them. You don't collapse them. And oh, also, right. if you think about things as continuous, then you don't you never run yeah, into yeah, the well, same. Plus, yeah. plus, you should also think about if, if the if the reward and next state are um, stochastic, then yeah. anyways, most likely you'll see like different realizations of the other two things each time. So right, I, I mean, think about the tabular case, right? So tabular case, you will actually run into the same as A or S prime tuple multiple times, and if even if you do the simplest algorithm in tabular setting, that is like estimated model, and then playing the estimated model, you will need to keep the multiple uh, copies around because that gives you the like max likelihood estimate, right? And actually, like that algorithm, that simplest tabular algorithm, correspond to using FQI, uh, to re running FQI with the tabular function space. So, so FQI is pretty uh, with value duration as the planning algorithm. So, all of these are consistent, okay? And so, and so when when C and actually in the paper we show that when C is unbounded, you can actually prove exponential lower bound. Um, which is um, somewhat so um, uh, not too surprising, and this is the assumption that I hope you convince you that this is like reasonable, and we'll move on to the more interesting assumption. So I won't uh, spend a lot of time on this, but just one quick comment about this assumption, uh, which I definitely didn't realize before I wrote this paper, is that usually we think of this assumption as the assumption on the data. Our data needs to be exploratory. Okay, so it's much more than that. Okay, so why do I say that? So our lower bound actually holds even if I allow you to choose the best data distribution in that particular MDP. So in our, in our lower bound, we have an MDP with known and deterministic dynamics, and the only thing unknown is the reward function. Okay, and, and I let you to choose the data distribution you want to sample from. So you can choose the best data distribution ever. Okay, still there's exponential lower bound. And the reason lies in here. Look, this is distribution induced by any policy pi. So if the MTP dynamics is very crazy, in particular, usually when we say crazy is when you have these like exponential tree structure, that even if you make a slightest change in action in the sequence of action you take, you get to a completely new and different region of the state space. 
That's a very crazy structure that you don't hope to overcome with function approximation. So, you, so, so what this assumption and what this lower bound is saying that this assumption is not only about ex the exploratory of the data distribution, but it's also about somewhat like smoothness of the data set. Oh, sorry, it's the smoothness of the MDP dynamics. Okay. So, um, yeah. So one sort of counter that this might suggest is, I'm curious what the lower bound would, would say about it is, so suppose, I mean, I, I don't know how to define this, but suppose I could conceptually think of um, a fitting procedure mm -hmm. which said, okay, so fifth breakage of the assumption is bad because there might be a policy whose data is not adequately supported by me. Sure. And now I, I don't know whether this policy is good or bad, so an estimator can output that policy being good and it will have a low fitting error still and it, it is a bad policy. Uh, but if I, if I consider an estimator which says, well, I will restrict to all policies for which the density ratio is good and amongst those policies, if I find a good one, I will output that and now I'm confident that that policy is good. Then in principle, it should not be a problem. It's just that I guess I and, don't and you enforce should, that density ratio constraint. Right, right. I, I think that should that should work, right? Yes. So, so it's it's just that algorithmically, or or, or even like information theoretically, there is no obvious way to enforce that constraint. Right. Yes. I mean, actually, we're. I mean, we've talked about this. I'm literally thinking about how to do that. Okay. So it should be. At least it doesn't seem hopeless. So anyway, so sorry to like being like too abstract here because I really want to get into the uh, more interesting assumption. So so let's just uh, like take it for granted that yes, we need data to be uh, exploratory, and one way to measure exploratory is, is to use this like C parameter that measures distribution mismatch. Okay, so let me just finish this. So we're gonna add this C over here so that we additionally allow dependence polynomially on C. Okay, so now let's ask the question again: Can we learn near optimal F? with this much sample complexity. Question. Yeah, so I'm wondering about your assumption about the data distribution. So uh, doesn't that in general depend on how the rewards are allocated across data and action space? Uh, if does that reward, depends on that? rewards? So as of the current uh, assumption, it doesn't depend on the reward. Yeah, but, but if you're somehow you have some other assumption on the reward, let's say <laughs> it doesn't really matter about, let's say that's uniform across the entire state. Sure. Right? Yeah, so really basically uh, what I'm saying, so basically the lower bound is, is not saying that this is the assumption that you need to make. You can definitely like weaken the assumption, relax the assumption using more information, right? So actually in the paper we talk about how to actually, it's closer to what you're saying, like a reason about the rewards and values and use that to relax this assumption, which is, as of now, it's only defined using the dynamics. So it's not very tight. But there are many ways of relaxing it. But the, but the lower bound says that you cannot get rid of such type of assumptions altogether. You need something here, right? OK, so, so let's accept that. So then here's the interesting part. Like, why do I need an additional assumption that beyonds realizability, which is already pretty crazy uh, in the point of view of supervised learning? OK, so to, to explain that, um, I'll need to um, explain, uh, give you the actual algorithm and give you a minimal simple example of how it works and how things can go wrong when you don't make that assumption. And let's see what happens there, okay? And the particular uh, algorithm I'm going to look into today is, as I said, like FIDEQ iteration, which has a, a close relation connection to uh, DQN if you're into DPRL. So how does FQI work? Right, so it's actually a very, very simple algorithm. So you initialize your function f0 in your function class arbitrarily, okay? Um, and in each, and it proceeds in iteration, so that's what we call fitted Q iteration. So in each iteration, you have your current function, ft minus one, okay? And what you're going to do is that you're gonna set up a regression data set from the state action reward next state tuples that is your true MVP data, RL data set, okay? You convert that into a least square regression data set where the features are the state action pairs and the target, the label, is what we call this empirical Bellman update that depends on F, okay? So what you're gonna do is that you're gonna just use your function approximation, approximator to solve this least square regression problem, 
Okay, and let's say we're going to do ERM. Okay, so basically this is the algorithm, right? So in every iteration, you plug in f t minus one over here, solve this least square regression problem, and the argument gives you the next iteration of the function, and you repeat it a couple of times until you don't need to, like it, in general it won't converge, but with the proper assumptions, after enough iterations, you will get a near optimal f under again under some assumptions. Okay. So, I mean, this is just a re mostly like a refresher for people who have seen this or similar things before, uh, before. And if you haven't seen this and not comfortable with the math here, you don't need to worry about it because in the example that I will show you, things are extremely simple and you don't need to like read through these maths. Okay? So, how FQI works. Let me simplify everything down to the simplest possible RL problem here where we have a only a chain of states, okay? So this is a problem where you always start with state number one, and there are no multiple actions. Every state has only one action, and that moves you like forward deterministically to the next state. The next step, you go to state three, four, all the way down, okay? And all the intermediate states give you zero reward. And you only get a reward that is like Bernoulli uh, with, uh, uh, it's like a half-half, like either one or zero with half-half uh, probability at the very end. And then this, this ends. This is the finite horizon setting. Okay, so let's just look at how, how like learning from bootstrap targets work in this case. Okay, so now because there's no action in this MDP, so our data set would just look like state, reward, and next state tuples, right? So what you will get, the data would look like something like I'm starting from state one or two, I get zero reward and transition to state three, and so on and so forth, and at the very end you get in state number 10, I get a reward of either one or zero roughly equal time, number of times, and then the, the process terminate, okay? So how will like FQI or any other like TD style algorithm work in this case? Well, so in the, in each, in the first iteration, basically you're converting your data set into a, you're, you're basically trying to average the reward here, right? So minimizing the square loss is correspond to just take the average. So you will estimate the reward at the very end, and let's say it's something like 5.01, okay? At, and starting from the next iteration, you look at it like state number nine, and you convert this into the regression data set that I was talking about, right? So now you know that state number 10 probably has a value that is around 0.5, so you use that to say, okay, if I'm, if from state number nine, I get a zero reward and transition to state number 10, then probably state number nine's value should be roughly around zero plus 0.501, right? And you solve this regression problem here, like it's pretty easy. And you just propagate that value all the way through to the very beginning. And you get a fair good estimation of the value in the initial state, okay? So this is like how things work in the simple, simple case. And this works, like nothing is wrong here. Okay, so let's see how it can go wrong. Okay, so previously it works because I'm giving it a very rich function class. Basically in the sense that you can feel free to predict any value for every single state. And as we'll see later, this is actually satisfying that assumption that's closeness, closeness under Bellman update. So now I'm going to restrict the values that you can predict for each state to, to mimic the function approximation setting, right? So although here we only have a very small number of states and you never need function approximation to lear for learning here, but just to mimic the setting of function approximation, we're gonna, we're gonna restrict what possible values that you can predict in each state, okay? And I'm gonna set up in a way such that the problem is still realizable, right? By realizability, I mean like, for every single state, the long-term value you would get from that state in this chain BP is always 0.5. So if you're allowed to predict 0.5 in every state, you're realizable, right? So, but in, in addition to that, I'm also allowing you to predict another value for each state. And if you look at it, so this is 0 0.501, 0 0.2, 0.504 and all the way to something around one. So if you really have a stable learning process and with a reasonable amount of data, 
you shouldn't, you should be able to find 0.5, right? So this, like, this value around one is ridiculously large. You shouldn't be able to, you, you shouldn't get that. And what I'm going to show you is that it's very likely for fit acute duration or any other TD algorithm when you run in this uh, environment to, 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 to hit this value. Okay, so how that works. Well, as, you, as previously, you, um, you average the reward you get at the very end, and you get a value of 0.501, okay? Okay, now, again, you form the data set that says state number nine should probably have a value around 0.501, and you run square loss minimization, okay? But here, we're, you can't report 0.501 because I'm restricting you to only being able to report from these two possible values. But if you look at these two values, they are equally distant from the label that you get by uh, using a bootstrap target from your previous iteration of learning. Okay? So you can just do some random tie breaking, and let's say um, you pick up like 0.502. Okay? And similarly, if you continue this process, you, you'll find that with uh, like unfortunate tie breaking, you can just pick up all the value in the second row. Okay? And if you uh, look at how I construct it, so the gap between uh, the second row and the first row is growing exponentially uh, as we move from the end of the chain to the beginning of the chain. So which means that, in general, if you want to be able to guarantee that you, the value you estimate for the initial state to be epsilon uh, close to the true value, you need to have exponential accuracy at the very end when you estimate the rewards. Okay, so, so your sample complexity would be exponential. Okay? And um, so this is realizable, and uh, so this example actually we give with Alec and uh, the colleagues at uh, MSR New York City in the uh, 2018 paper, but like similar conclusions for, um, have been known for decades um, since very early. Okay? <clears throat> okay, so, so now how do you fix this assumption, right? So that, uh, how do you fix this issue, right? So, so we know that if you make additional assumptions, you can, you can get a polynomial sample complexity. So it must be that I, we are going to make uh, some assumptions so that this issue goes away. So in particular, the kind of assumption you can make is that, let's say I'm, I'm stick to like this particular function class for this particular time step, okay? You can either report 0.1 or 0.628, okay? Then I'm gonna require that in my function approximation, I should always be able to predict both 0.5 and 0.628 for the previous level, right? And in this way, if this is satisfied, then even if I make a wrong prediction at this time step, like error won't like propagate, right? So in this case, the best predictor for state number two would also be 0.628. So error doesn't blow up between time steps. And in particular, uh, the more general uh, version of this assumption is saying that, look, every, time, every duration we're gonna have this regression problem. We're gonna assume that this regression problem is realizable with our function approximator. And this is what I was saying, like, this is correspond to the function class closed under Bellman update. Because the Bellman update to the current function is the base optimal predictor for this regression problem, okay? And what does that mean? Why is that not a good assumption to make in general, right? So think about what happens in this finite horizon setting. It means that, like, in general, we want to use rich function approximator to guarantee realizability, right? So if you use a very rich function class for a later time step, it makes realizability harder to satisfy for a higher level, right? So you will need to use rich, richer, 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 and crazily richer function classes to guarantee realizability. And in the, in, in the discounted infinite horizon setting, there's everything stationary, so there's no like, explicit notion of a her, like, time steps now. And in that case, this assumption becomes uh, this property that says f is closed under a particular operator, right? And you know these kind of like closeness property, they're not monotone in the sense that if you get a richer function class, these kind of assumptions may be broken, right? In, and in comparison, if you're in supervised learning, when you get a richer function class, 
realizability will always be satisfied in a better way, or at least equally better way. Okay? So uh, I would just say, like, without uh, giving you actually the analysis, I would just let you know that with this, this, this assumption, you can actually get the desired sample complexity. Okay? But this assumption is, uh, I mean, if possible, we want to avoid it. Okay. So all of these like hardness result is hinting at the at the uh, conclusion or conjecture that in RL, in, in particular in off in batch RL with value function approximation, if we only assume realizability as the representation condition, we're not going to get learning to succeed, right? And in particular, we have already seen these, uh, uh, this particular counter example. And I would just say that most of the known algorithms for, um, uh, are, uh, fall into this category of like using dynamic programming plus least square regression, uh, which are all subject to the same counter example. And it seems like there are not much more you can do uh, in the batch learning setting. And uh, as I also mentioned before, um, this closeness assumption is not the only assumption you can make. You can make like many other different assumptions, but all of them are like undesired in one way or the other, or another way. Um, okay. So, man, I'm trying to understand sort of the first statement you made, which is qualified to just most known algorithms as opposed to all possible algorithms. And the the thing in particular I'm trying to uh, understand there is. So we know, uh, due to existing lower bounds, that in the, um, okay, so, so, so maybe, maybe this leap is not quite true. So in the exploration setting, I know that realizability alone is, is enough. Yes, exactly. No, no, it's yes. insufficient, right? In Wait, the why? exploration setting, just realizability without Further assumptions, structural no, assumptions. Structure, that is structural assumption corresponds to the concentratability coefficient, the data distribution assumption. Well, okay, so I, I thought when you said realizability. Really Along as the representation assumption on function class. Ah, oh, yeah. Okay. We're still assuming that the data distribution thing, right? Okay, so so this suggests realizability is not above. Well, if this is really true, then we should be able to get an information theoretic lower bound that is agnostic to the choice of algorithm, right? So it's like regardless of what algorithm you use, you cannot, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be able to achieve polynomial learning in this setting. It should be obvious, right? Okay, so th this is the conjecture that we say. So it's like if F is realizable, um, there exists a family of hard instances where the worst case sample complexity of any algorithm cannot be this polynomial, okay? So if we can prove this, we're really like say, okay, yes, like our policy, like batch value function approximation is hard with realizability alone, and we need to enforce additional or stronger representation conditions. Okay, so, so let's. What does information theoretic mean here now? Because I mean, just the algorithms. In the no, but, 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 but in a way, I, you give me the data. Yes. I can build whatever it means to build a model with that data. Exactly. Well, that's the next slide. Okay. <laughs> so now, um, so now, let's think about what you can do from a, uh, and, and I will talk about why this is an important conjecture to prove at the end of this talk. Uh, I think I'm still on track. Okay. So, so how do you prove a hardness result like this in learning theory, right? So if you, uh, if you have taken a learning theory class, uh, what, you, what we usually do is that we're gonna re literally like construct usually a family of hard instances that's usually exponentially large, and somehow you prove that like with some like math, math, math like massage, you prove that no algorithm can achieve this. So you're gonna try to follow the same uh, similar therapy here, right? So we're gonna construct a, a big, uh, big M of a MD, family of MDP instances, and we're going to choose one of them uh, for any given algorithm in an adversarial manner. Okay, we're hoping to like induce hardness in this way, right? And naturally, we're going to give um, the uh, the agent this function class f that is minimal and realizable for any choice of MDP. Right? You just collect all the Q star function and give that to the agent. Okay, and what we want to show is that polynomial sample complexity is not achievable 
in this case, right? Okay, so this, I'm, I'm not actually making an attempt at all. I'm just barely writing down what you would do as a like high level template uh, in learning theory, and all the actual work should be how do you actually design this family and how do you actually do the subsequent proof, right? And you can try, and, and that's where all the cleverness should lie in, okay? But even with this abstract template, I'm telling you that you're already failing, okay? So there exists this information theoretical algorithm that does achieve the sample complexity in this setting. So this is like how, where things starting to get weird, okay? So why is that? Let, let, I, I, without getting into the details, let me explain what's happening here. Basically what happens is that if you, so in the information theoretic lower bound, you kind of like assume that your agent can special, your learner can specialize to that family of adversarial instances, okay? And, in that, and, and, and it can do anything it wants, okay? So basically here is what the learner can do. What it can do is that it can create a value function class that is slightly bigger than the number of instances, yet it's closed under Bellman update. So it can run something like a FIDIQ iteration and just get polynomial sample complexity. Okay? So this is pretty weird. But really what it's telling us is that, so this is a model-based agent, right? So it's, it's, it's heavily using the knowledge of the restricted model class. Okay, so this really tells us that we need to carefully distinguish between model-based agent and value-based agent, and that distinction is not captured by this simple scheme. Okay. So, so knowing that, I went on to my like second attempt, which I will not uh, discuss in detail here in the interest of time. But I'll just say that there are some uh, interesting ideas of, of how you prevent an agent from being model-based and force it to be value-based. And uh, just to say that very um, simply, what, we're doing, what I'm doing here is basically to say, okay, I'm given this data set, okay, and I have this function approximator like f. What I'm gonna do is that I mask the data set before I pass it on to the learner. The learner will no longer be able to see the state, and instead, what he can do is that he for any state in the data, it can query its value for any function f in my function class. And what you can show is that you can basically run all the known value-based algorithms using this information alone. But that will like, create some difficulty for the agent because it can no longer directly access this, the underlying state. And this idea, uh, actually, uh, uh, a similar idea for the uh, linear function approximation case has been proposed by Rich Sutton and uh, Andy Bardo in their, you can find it in their latest version of the RL textbook. So basically, in the linear function approximation case, it corresponds to only revealing the features of state for linear function approximation. So if you have two states that have identical features, this learner cannot distinguish between them, just as any value-based algorithms cannot, right? So that hopefully will induce some difficulty. And um, basically what, we're, what we showed in the paper is that um, if, if this is the only idea you use to induce hardness, it also fails, okay? So I, I won't get into detail here, but just to show you like, like how surprisingly and ridiculously hard this lower bound is. When you say in tabular setting, you obviously don't mean that you have a tabular value function class. I don't. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so, and, and I have like a whole checklist of uh, plausible constructions that I have to clear. So to be honest, what happens when I think about this uh, lower bound construction, I haven't even made the step where I have a construction that seems plausible, but I just don't know how to prove the lower bound. Is that I've come up with maybe 20 constructions and all of them are killed by upper bounds, polynomial upper bounds. And if any construction exists, it needs to clear like a long list of like uh, a, a long list of requirements. For example, it cannot be tabular because we know that the tabular function space is closed under Bellman update. Uh, it cannot be uncontrolled because you can do Monte Carlo. So there's some caveats there. And the, here's an interesting one. The construction cannot be deterministic, okay? So because if your environment is really deterministic, 
there is extremely simple thing you can do, okay? So this is the algorithm that looks kind of like FQI, except that, or when you run Q learning, you can also minimize or doing gradient update uh, using this objective, except that you need to block the gradient here, right? So this is the target network in DQN. But if your environment is actually deterministic, all you need to do is to remove the blocking. It's like one line change of code in DQN, and this algorithm works under realizability. And, it, and if, you, if you think I'm just uh, being a theoretician, like just uh, bluffing, some, like bluffing about something, we actually try this algorithm, literally just a few line changes of code, and here is what you see, right? So this is DQN doing like, trying to balance in this carpool. It learns a fairly good policy, but still like this whole thing, like just the um, swing off the, uh, the screen. And this is what you do with this Bellman residual minimization, like a few line change of code and you get a perfectly balancing policy, okay? Um, but what we, do, what we do see is that as you increase the inherent stochasticity of the environment, this algorithm actually like breaks down. Which means that if you want to, break, want to show that realizability alone is not enough, you need to have a construction that is seriously stochastic. And none of the lower bound construction we know in RL literature have any serious stochasticity at all, okay? Okay, so, and there are some other, like, this, this list, I can, like, like, keep going on with this, like, long list, which is pretty crazy. Okay, so I guess I'm almost uh, down. So, just want to go back and reflect a little bit on why I care about this conjecture at all, right? So, or what does this work really tell us about the overall picture of reinforcement learning with function approximation. So here what I'm drawing is like a different uh, settings or scenarios of RL, starting from tablet RL and RL with function approximation, uh, either in the batch learning setting or the online exploration setting with value-based approximation, value function approximation or model, um, or you're trying to learn the environment dynamics, okay? So what we have learned from this work and all the previous work that we've been doing on online exploration setting, basically all of them share this property that says like RL can be tractable if you make two kind of like two assumptions, one on data and the environment and the other on the function class. And it turns out that except for in this region where you're doing batch value function approximation, in all the other cases, the assumption you need on the function class is simply realizability, okay? And, but if, but, so, and, and there, there's also <clears throat> interesting, um, and also by studying each of these uh, settings carefully, we also know the power of, for example, what's the power of doing online exploration? And what's the power of, like, being to uh, mo uh, model the dynamics versus model the value function and so on and so forth. So if the conjecture that I was uh, uh, talking about is true, we have these interesting gap separations between different set, uh, settings of RL. For example, we already know that if I have uh, exploratory data plus realizable model class, we can do efficient uh, like polynomial learning uh, in the batch learning setting. And that will create a ga gap between value-based and model-based RL. And similarly, our prior work in the online exploration setting shows that as long as the environment is um, like nice and smooth, all we need is realizability to do good exploration, okay? And if the conjecture is true, that will create another gap that actually tells you that being able to do exploration actually gives you a lot of power. So I think this, this conjecture here is kind of like a very pretty important piece towards our like understanding of the big picture of RL and what settings are tractable, what settings are more powerful than others, and so on and so forth. So with that said, I'm, I'm hoping to um, like resolve this open problem in the future, and I hope to get some of you interested in thinking about similar problems as well. Okay, so that's the, um, anyway, yeah, that's the end of my talk, and thank you for coming. Yeah. So, uh, so, so, so I guess uh, if you were to wake up in a more positive mood, uh, <laughs> going back to the previous slide, one might uh, wonder 
all the things on the all the attempts on the checklist that are broken by specific algorithms are they broken by the same specific algorithm because then we can at least feel somewhat good about that algorithm that okay it, it does seem to work under many um, qualifications yeah. possible qualifications yeah i don't know i haven't thought about that i don't think there's um, okay Yeah, I don't know. I haven't thought about that. Okay. But but basically, like there, the 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 other issue is that, and why, the reason why I'm so confident about this conjecture is that in the batch learning setting, there are not many things you can do, right? If yeah. all you're given is a function approximator, basically you can do two things: Bellman residual minimization or like bootstrap learning. That's it. Okay, and each of them suffers from different issues. Yeah. Okay. I'm curious if uh, you went back to DQN and Atari uh -huh. and changed the properties of Atari, like either the horizon or things like uh -huh. that, to check empirically is DQN behaving polynomial kinds of sample complexity or, like, I don't know, is, is 80 million samples polynomial or expensive? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, also, but the other thing is that also, like, uh, is, your, is your value function, no, so, so it's not about, so I would say, like in practice, it's not about a polynomial versus exponential, right? So in practice, what what at the end of the day, what you get, uh, for example, if you look at this this example, what you get is that with enough data, like DQN will already converge to some policy. Even with more data, it probably doesn't improve. Okay, but what happens is that it will learn a much more suboptimal policy because the way that approximation error is characterized under that assumption, right? So, so remember that assumption I said is like, f is, the, the function class is closed under Bellman error. So the way you measure approximation error there is gonna say, like, this is called something called inherent Bellman error that says you do f prime minus t of f, and I think it's inf uh, f prime sub f. So this is, this is different from how you measure the violation of realizability and potentially it gives you a higher approximation error, right? So if anything, we should be, I think we have some, I mean, with this primary work, we have some results that shows that in this deterministic setting, where Bellman residual minimization is really trying to, like, can really work under realizability. So it's in, in some cases, it's actually getting better solution asymptotically. So uh, you were trying to approximate the Q-value function here. Right. But uh, the, the policy that's greedy with respect to this Q-value function, what is the guarantee on the quality of that? Because in general, I mean, if you, the Q-value function may have a very low error, but the policy with, that's greedy with respect to it can have a pretty bad error. Oh, well, I mean, there is a bound, but it's, it's a theory bounded, but there is a bound that says, say it can right. Be, it can be a factor of yeah, Factor of a horizon, yeah. Okay. Uh, factor of a horizon uh, off. I'm more curious about the flipped version of that, which is that for a policy that's within epsilon close to optimal policy, uh, how much error can I tolerate in my Q values? Because it can be arbitrary. Well, it can be arbitrary, right? I can have yeah. inflated gaps like crazy. Yeah. So, um, I mean, the, the other way to say so the other way to say it, which we we mentioned in our previous papers on exploration, is to say if you you cannot you just simply cannot hope to compete with the best greedy policy. Because what you can, because that's basically policy search. There is no value function approximation anymore, because you can just uh, do a, uh, you can just start with a policy class and make up a value function class such that the greedy policies are those policies. But you can, uh, there's no way that you can enjoy the additional gain of doing value function approximation in that case, right? Uh, you also, uh, so you, by realizability, you meant that the optimal Q-value function. Yes. But at the same time, you were looking for an epsilon optimal Q-value function. Sure. Right? Yeah. It can be like, you can tolerate small errors. That's not a problem. But essentially, what I'm wondering is why do you need, why do you care about the re realizability of the optimal Q-value function if you are, if you are only looking for an epsilon optimal? Like, can you? Can you get away with the assumption that an epsilon optimal Q-value function is realized? I think those like small epsilon errors are usually small modifications to the upper bound, and uh, it's just uh, how to say it's um, doesn't like affect the qualitative nature of all these results. Oh, yeah, so, so usually, like for example, if I if I cannot capture the exact Q star, 
but I have a function that is enough close to it, then all I can say, then I can say that, you know, I, I won't be able to output a, uh, like, a arbitrarily optimal policy to you that even if I get infinite data, my policy will still be slightly off, uh, like, slightly suboptimal. And that gap depends on the approximation error in my function class. But that's just a more robust and relaxed version of the theorem that you will get with exact realizability. Okay, but you, would, you will still be able to guarantee that you, you will get something. Yeah. yeah, sure. Okay. But, but, but the other thing you have to be very careful about is uh, once you start getting to these um, epsilons, what is the notion of the, what, what is the measure under which you are? Oh, sure, yes. like worst case, for, worst case distribution. For, for robustness, you would, you would basically have an L-infinity. Well, uh, if you mean like a worst overall possible distributions. That's in right, 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 yes. Yeah. Yeah. It, that's so, the extension so of L-infinity. very extreme notion of like being close to Q star that. Yeah, the, 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 the thing of like these like worst over all distributions is simply because, you know, in supervised learning, there is a distribution that is the data distribution. In RL, like, I mean, there's just a no single notion of what's the right distribution. So you need to consider all distributions simultaneously. Yep. yep. So I'm wondering, so here, what you basically show is kind of like subject to the greedy policy. So I'm wondering if you, literally have policy class and just use those batch data to do policy evaluation using another function class to model the value, just find the best one of them. And that would be, would that still subject to your role one that you might have? Uh, uh, I think so. Well, depending on your precise setup. So, so we actually thought about, about uh, I mean, I thought about it a little bit because like uh, recently like uh, Chang Liu and Li Hong had this paper um, like doing our policy evaluation, but I mean, if you look at their, so they do off policy evaluation, but if you look at what they need in order to do off policy, optimize, policy optimization, it will require similar kind of like closeness type of assumptions. So basically, you know, like. So what yeah. I mean is that, so you have a set of policy class and then you basically, you have a serial like, like the ability of the epsilon to that. So, you, so for every policy you can find its value function. Right, right, so yes, yes, right. if you have that, so still in the off policy setting, it's not enough because even, so if, if all you have is these like uh, SARS prime tuples, mm -hmm. even the problem of doing policy evaluation for a single policy can run into this issue, right? So if you look at this um, counter example, there's no actions. We're just doing policy evaluation, right? So even that, so in addition, so okay, so the set of working assumptions that we know for now is like, for each policy pi, the function class, or you have a function class that is close under its policy specific Bellman update operator. And then when you do TD learning to learn that its value function, you would be able to do it accurately. Otherwise, the same kind of like counterexample still applies. So that's why I usually just think about like FQI because, or Q learning, because when you do these like policy evaluations, then you just introduce even more assumptions. Wait, but so, so are you requiring that this policy class, uh, that, that the, value, the Q value function of every policy that you encounter by running the algorithm needs to be also realizable by this? No, policy? no, this or version doesn't, doesn't. If you do Q learning, you don't need that. Yeah. But, but if you do a Shindan suggestion, you would. Yeah, if you do policy uh, evaluation, you may need that. No, but so, so there is, if you just assume that uh, the Q value function of the optimal policy needs to be realizable, but not of any other policy, then this, this uh, reconciles the two because in policy evaluation, there is only one optimal. Right, but, but the thing, is that, but the thing is that if you are, if for some other policy, you don't have the corresponding value function in your class, then when you evaluate that policy, you may overestimate its value due to evaluation error, right? <laughs> and you may incorrectly think that's a very good policy. I mean, if you're only worried about policy evaluation for one policy, there is no issue. That yeah, there's no issue. Right. Up when you're trying to do policy improvement. Yeah. Right. Or just policy optimization. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Every time I think about like these policy optimization with evaluation kind of thing, I just feel like they need even more assumptions yeah. than this. So it's a crazy question. So I'm, I'm curious if, uh, I was just thinking about like the distributional value function based things, right? I'm not thinking about a single value function that's outputting a value, but a distribution over it. 
uh, I, I won't really wonder what, 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 what do we gain from it. Yeah. But essentially, I'm thinking because realizability in that sense is a much, much stronger assumption. It's stronger, yes. Right? So does that help us break some of the hardest? Maybe. At, at least, so for example, we've been thinking about this like a value profile thing, right? right. At least the uh, modeling the distribution will break that. But I, I don't think it will what be... It wouldn't break your counterexample. It though. probably won't, but uh, wait. That's is... another example. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, me. It might. It can, right? If I'm maintaining distributions over. Maintain uh, no, no, because the, the, it's Bernoulli, so the distribution is just characterized by the mean, one parameter. So there isn't anything more than uh, the distribution, right? Right. right. There, there is so, a, so if you. If you oh, in each of the intermediate states, you would be maintaining a distribution over the allowed. values that you. But that distribution uh, is characterized. But, but it's still a Bernoulli. If you know that it's Bernoulli. Still a Bernoulli, so you just right. need to get the mean. And if you minimize K or whatever, you should always just. Uh, I don't, I don't uh, know. Can you still do? Yeah, just, oh, no, it's just moment matching, right? Yeah, probably. Yes. Right. At least, at least for Bernoulli, for this example, I don't think it changes anything. Yeah, my I, my intuition is that it doesn't really get you too far. But it seems like model base will get you much more. Okay. Cool. Oh, let's thank Matt again. Do you know where the